It's time for Cash Plays, where we turn bustos into robustos. Brought to you by StackHomeCoaching.com. Rethink poker. And now, your hosts, John Kim and Joe Tihan. What's up, guys? Hey, what's, what's going up, on, John? guys? What's up, Joe? I, I like the way they introduced my name ahead of yours, so they got down. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to have to get that fixed. <laughs> ASAP. <laughs> no, it's perfect the way it is. Uh, Cash Play is brought to you by StackhamCoaching.com. Rethink poker and use promo code QUADJAX82 for a free day trial. If you guys want to get better at poker live, on, online, whatever, um, we have some great coaching over there. And I think everyone's losing value uh, if you want to improve in your games by not taking advantage of this offer. So anyways, today, Joe and I were discussing over the weekend, um, changing a few things around. I think since we're very accomplished pros, um, you know, for a, for a long time also, we have a wealth of information to share with everybody out there, all our listeners. So I figured we'd just like not get into yeah. any wishy-washy stuff and just go straight to strat- strategic stuff and just, you know, tap into our vast valley of knowledge. Right, Joe? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I called John after our show last week and I said, you know, no one's ever going to want to listen to us as radio show talk show hosts because <laughs> we're just not going to make it. I mean... I mean, I'd much rather listen to someone like Marco, but you know, when it comes to talking about poker and and talking strategy, I think I think both John and I have really good insight to the game. So we're gonna try to focus primarily on that. All right. So uh, we want to maximize the value of this hour of our show to our <laughs> listeners. Uh, actually, listen to try to improve their games instead of us offering thoughts on what's going on in the poker industry. And we'll leave that to Marco and other people who do a great job at that. Yeah. So, okay. So, first thing we want to get into is um, listener emails. We actually got an email, an interesting one. This is from Corey. Uh, his email is I am fairly new to PLO 8 and prefer to play it over Hold'em now. Can you and Joe explain three bet ranges and how to polarize hand ranges in that game? Also, what are some spots where you can bet super thin knowing certain situations? Uh, can I mention this last part, Joe? Yes. <laughs> Yeah, he he wants to learn how to stack Joe in the game in Ventura. So I guess he he's plays with Joe on a semi regular basis. So you yeah, can I know take, you can take this. <laughs> hey, Corey, I know Corey's a really funny guy, really cool guy. But um, uh, I don't know. I think he just wants to learn how to stack me in the game, which shouldn't be that difficult. Uh, but like looking at his question, I mean explaining three bet ranges and how to polarize hand ranges in that game like um we haven't really done we haven't talked too much about PLOA although I that's the game I've been playing mostly uh recently and I know it's been spreading kind of in various areas uh and it's it's a really fun game the the biggest difference between PLO and and Hold'em it's like there's so much more information in PLO. You have four cards, and you know you're almost always going to be up against some sort of nut, like some sort of draw to like a nutted hand. You know what I mean? Um, so everything you do in like PLO, it's it's mostly all about value. You know what I mean? Whereas whereas in when you're playing Hold'em, it's you're kind of betting for information. You're kind of betting for value. You know, you're later on in the hand, you're you know it becomes more of a value game. But, like, in PLO, like, you pretty much know where you're at, like, the whole time. You know, you know what your good starting hands are. You know what your good flops are. So it's, like, it's all about getting max value um, in certain spots. So uh, are you saying there is not much bluffing going on in PLO 8? Uh, I mean, of course there's bluffing in every game. Um, but, but not as much yeah, as it's not. It's not nearly as much as in Hold'em. No, I wouldn't. It, it's all a game of, like, you know, um, am I getting the most value when I have the best hand, or am I am I paying off too much when I'm behind? Things like that. Uh, it just seems like there's a certain line you should take depending on your cards. Um, whereas in No Limit Hold'em, you can deviate from that and try to rep- represent different hands. But in PLA, you're pretty much kind of handcuffed to play your hand, and you're just saying you need to get max value when you can, and need to just know when to get away. Um, even what sometimes like nutted has, I guess sometimes you have to fold the nuts, right? Because you might get quartered or whatever. 
if it's too I mean, early. I don't know. People have said that to me. I don't know. I, <laughs> I don't remember I, ever doing it. <laughs> I mean, I don't like to admit that I'm not very versed in a certain type of game, but PLO 8 might be the one game where I have the least amount of experience. I'm sure so, once you play it a little bit, you'll get you'll get a good hang of it. Um, uh, I've played it before, trust me. And I, I, you know, just there are spots where I'm not sure what to do. So, um, But I, I find this question kind of interesting because... He's talking about three betting a polarized range in PLO eight. Does that even exist? Like just three betting no, crappy like, hands in PLO eight. Like, I mean, the you know the worst hand. I, I don't. I don't three bet like too much with like you're not three betting with crappy hands. It's it's the same thing as before. Like the most you can three bet is like the size of the pot, and usually the guy that opened in the first place probably has a better hand than you. So it's like. There's no real reason to like three bet as it as it is in Hold'em. You're three betting all for value. You know what I mean? I'm I'm three betting all my value hands. If I think I'm ahead of my opponent's range, then I'm three betting those. Um, so you're never three betting a hand like three, four, five, six. Uh, I mean, that would probably be for I don't know. I don't that know. would probably. I'm trying I mean, to think maybe, of like the like the other side when he's asking if there's a polarized range you can three bet. I know in PLL there's definitely are. Um, you can three bet hands to get it heads up uh, a polarized range, but PLO eight. It just seems like since you already mentioned we're playing our cards basically and just trying to play optimally. Do you yeah. want to have like trash hands we're three betting with? Is I, that viable? No, I, I don't really think it's it's going to pay off all that much. Um, I don't I don't do it, and I don't see it done at all. And and you're just you're just throwing away money. I mean, a lot of times you're up against dominated hands, and yeah, you might have position, you might have aggression, but just overall, like, you know, guys are gonna know. Okay, well, I f I have like this draw with this hand, and I'm a you know, and it doesn't matter. Like, even if they think you have like ace ace whatever, you know what I mean? You're trying to you're, you're trying to like rep one thing. Where it's really hard to rep anything in that game. It's like everything is going to be out there. Like if you don't have it, your opponent's going to have it. So um, I don't. Yeah, like I said, I'm just not three betting at all in that game um, without value hands. Um, and it's like it's the same thing with like raising preflop. Like my raise sizing. Or I think raise sizing. It's all about what you're trying to accomplish. You know, if you have hand like ace two three four like i talked to a lot of people and they have like ace two three four playing whether it's omaha eight or better um or like plo eight or better like people won't want to three bet people won't want to raise with that hand preflop because they're like oh well, why don't i just call and see the flop and then and then i can go with it i mean well like even you can answer <laughs> like even you you say you don't know much about plo but you definitely know like you should be raising that hand i mean yeah well, uh, that's what I'm saying. Our three betting range then is basically all for value. It's never bluffs ever in this game, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, that, that's the answer. Okay. And then uh, another quick question he had was, are there certain spots where you can bet super thin? And I remember we had a discussion about this where you mentioned the no limit player, pretty proficient no limit player, playing PLO 8 for maybe like his first time or uh, one of his first times and you were noting that he was missing some obvious value betting spots on the river um, I mean to some guys I think this is what Corey's talking about some guys it might look thin but in your eyes it's, it should be a bet for value right like I think the guy had uh, like second nuts and a big high hand um, he didn't oh, have nuts yeah. either way but it was heads up so he's almost never getting scoot but he checked back the river because he wasn't nutted either way right I, yeah. yeah, and like, you know, and and no one else would really. I I remember the hand he had like, and if you if no if people don't know how to play PLO eight or better, I guess this is even bad to talk about. But um, <clears throat> in, in this hand, he had a uh, jack ten deuce three, and the board came like ace six or ace five jack, um, and he back got called in one spot. The turn was a six. Um, so he had the nut low with deuce three. The board was ace five six, and he had deuce three for nut low and a pair of jacks. And the guy check called again, and then the river was an ace. Um, <clears throat> and I was just, I was actually there watching him, and I'm like, wow, that has got to be the best card in the deck. Like he should always just bet the pot here on the river because it's likely the the other guy's check calling down with a hand like, you know, 
uh, deuce four five or 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 three four five or and some sort of low with maybe maybe three four six or deuce four six or you know you could have an ace with a worse low but I mean you're almost never ever getting scooped when the guy just <laughs> falls two streets there you know what well, I mean so well I didn't even know he had nut low yeah he has nut low plus a semi decent high hand and it's heads up so. yeah yeah I mean and it's better than a decent high hand with a jack there and um. Yeah, and then he checked back the river, and I was just thinking, wow, like, you know, and these are the spots, these are the spots, like, in poker that people don't even realize when they're winning, like, he just, he just raked in the pot, and he never even thought about it, he's like, oh, maybe I should have bet there, but he didn't really care, because he's still dragging in a couple hundred dollar pot, right, so people don't even think about that, and I think that's, like, John and I were talking about this earlier, and I think it's, like, a really, really good point to make, um, it's like the ace queen hand that that the one kid was talking about. Um, why don't we? Yeah, let's. Why don't we talk about that one, J.K.? Okay, so we'll move on from PLO. So your point is people are missing value bets in PLO eight because they're worried they're going to get quartered stuff like that. I guess he had the nut low, so he's assuming uh, he might get quartered. So therefore, he's taking the safe route. But if he understands PLO eight, it's hard to get scooped, then he should definitely be value betting. Uh, yeah. Most time, he's going to get three quarters. Sometimes. Um, he's going to scoop, um, get called by the second nut low with like a pair of sixes or whatever. So th those are spots where for experienced players like yourself, it's an auto value bet, but some people might think it's thin and they check it back. But th again, it just takes experience and knowledge of understanding PLO8. Have you ever played with Mike Matisau on PLO8? Someone asked. No, I haven't. Okay, I haven't. so you don't, you don't know how he, someone asked if he's any good or not. Um, but uh, I heard he's a pretty good mixed game player, so I'll give him that. Um, but yeah, the, the ace queen hand is kind of a similar um, concept. You want to mention the hand, Joe? Oh, the ace queen hand. Um, where is that? Let me see. Okay, uh, I'll just say. Yeah, go uh, ahead. Read. It's a one-two game. The guy buys in for a hundred bucks, so fifty big blinds. He raises, or uh, no, under the gun raises to five. Uh, he, he, hero raises to 20 button calls under the gun calls are 60 in the pot uh, 63 in the pot flop ace 10 5 rainbow under the gun checks hero bets all in for 84 bucks into a 63 dollar pot he figures top pair second nut kicker uh, might as well shove button calls under the gun folds and his comment is I think I messed up my bet sizing here um, I shoved because stack sizes were awkward and it was a small over bet I think but buttons range is pretty strong when he cold calls. Obviously, I agree with that. Maybe yeah. like sets, ace, queen, plus. I don't think I'm ever not going broke here with such a small stack to pot ratio, but I think I could have done a little more to keep ranges wider. Um, so, what? Do you, yeah, this is the hand. What do you think about it? Yeah, I mean, like the one thing that I always say um, to really, really, if you really want to improve your poker game, it's like... Whether or not you win or lose the pot, I mean, it's hard not to be emotional at the time. Uh, you know, when you when you win the pot, you're happy about it. When you lose the pot, you're pissed. But it's, you know, you just want to think about things like after every pot or after every big decision, it's like, okay, should I have played this differently? And, um, like, yeah, for instance, this ace-queen hand, I mean, it's almost a no-brainer. The guy's almost always going broke unless he sees the guy's hand or, I mean, <laughs> you know, whatever. The guy's... Pretty much I was going broke, but the point is like, what's the best way to get the money in? How are we gonna, how are we gonna induce like worse hands to come in? Um, yeah, how like you don't want you don't just like in this in this spot. I mean, you know, shoving eighty four dollars into a sixty dollar pot on a Ace ten four or Ace ten five rainbow board like is like very bad. Uh, it's very bad. I mean. You know, it seems wants... like, for most amateur players, it seems like it's just the uh, the play to make. You have a little over pot. Like he said, he has a little over pot bet. He has top pair, second nut kicker, so why not just shove it in and hope for the best? But yeah, I know what exactly what you're saying, and this goes back to the PLO 8 hand, is we tend to overlook things, um, and we went, we're missing out on a lot of value in the long run when we tend to overlook things. Like the kid didn't value bet his deuce 3, jack 10, 
uh, spot, and he was content with raking in the pot then. But he probably left an expected value of, you know, say the pot was a thousand. He probably left about two, three hundred of value out there, uh, theoretically. And then in this spot, yeah, uh, the end result, the guy had ace king that called him, and he ended up losing a stack. But uh, but the end result, no matter what he did, it's going to be the same. He's going to lose his hundred dollars. But we can't look at it like that. It's even though in some hands the end result is going to be the same, no matter what line you take. There are definitely plus EV, better EV lines to take. And mm. um, like you said, it, shoving is bad because of the, it goes directly correlates with this point I'm making. Is that you're giving up equity in the long run, even though the end result in this specific one hand might not matter, but I, we have to look at every hand, um, like what this, what would create the most equity in an infinite sample number of hands. So if we bring up the situation in an infinite number of hands, we don't want to be sho over shoving here because we're just going to be getting called by ace king set stuff like that. We want yeah. a value bet like thirty to forty ish with forty behind, and we just call a shove. Uh, this way, a couple of reasons why we keep the calling range is wider uh, when we overshove we're usually going to just tend to get called by it's the old adage called by better fold not all worse but if we bet half pot whatever we can get called by way more uh, wider range and some worse hands so um, it, it, you know there is there is a fine line though I mean I do see, you see a lot of people who just like you know they'll raise preflop and now and, and I see this with a lot of tournament players it's like they'll raise preflop with like a hand like king queen and now it comes like you know king 10 7 or whatever and now they'll like check and they'll they'll like check call they'll take all these like weird lines I, you know i mean there's a fine line between um you know keeping in worse hands but also betting to protect your hand um you know in a spot like that where you have king queen on a board like that it, you almost always have to bet because you're getting value from, from like a, a ton of draws that are going to call you, uh, all sorts of straight draws and flush draws and, uh, you know, double gutters and worse kings, uh, whatever it may be. You know what I mean? Um, no. So I think there is a fine line between you know betting for protection and like you know not over betting to where you don't you don't want to get it to a point where you're only going to get called by better hands like. All right. On a board like King Ten Seven, you have King Queen. You're gonna get called by a lot, a lot of worse hands. But you know, it, but on the flip side, like on a board like Ace Ten Five, where you shove <laughs> for one point two times the pot or one point three times the pot, you're only getting called by better hands. So I, I mean, I think there is a fine line, you know, in betting for protection with certain right. hands and and you know just. <clears throat> uh, I don't know. I kind of like spaced out there. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's okay. But yeah, I, I think the main consideration, again, reiterating our point, is a lot of stuff uh, for most players, it, it's just going to come like secondhand and not, they're not going to, they're going to overlook things and say, well, I have top pair second kicker. I'm supposed to go broke there. Yeah. Uh, so it doesn't matter what happens. But in reality, there's a lot of spots where people are missing out on value in the long run by not taking the most optimal line. And they just, they're just results oriented. We get caught up in that all the time. Poker, uh, a big mistake most poker players make is being just results oriented. And you know, I tell everyone in poker like it's not about results; it's about making the correct decisions. Even though the end result here is the same, but you're actually in theory and in equity wise, you're giving up uh, a certain amount of dollars equity wise over the long run, and it, that's going to add up to a ton of money. So the best players in the world. Um, and I, I, mean, I like to classify myself and, your, and you uh, as up there, um, but uh, the best players in the world definitely think along the lines of like, w how do we gain the most equity in the spot? It's not about, you know, like, oh, we want to win this hand, we want to protect this hand, blah, blah, blah. Um, but it's all about EV. So even though yeah. no matter what, you know, there's been many hands where you and I have spoken said, oh, you're going broke no matter what, which is a very simple statement, but there's a, a means to get to that point, a good way and a bad way of going broke. And, yeah. and even though it may not matter in this one specific hand, but it definitely matters over, again, a large sample of hands if you're in that same situation over and over again. So that's basically the point we're making. Um, but let's go on to this next hand. I was playing 
I was coaching uh, a student last night, watching her play one two, and I want your thoughts on this spot. Uh, I want to get into a little bit about preflop bet sizing. Um, okay. There's a very spewy, splashy bad player he had like 400 bucks at one two so he had a stack winning a bunch of hands uh he was opening a lot of hands um so he raises a 12 under the gun in a one two game and she's got the hero here has about 250 uh so a little over 100 bbs and she three bets in position to 60 with pocket eights uh and the guy ends up folding and you know i obviously i i thought her three bet sizing was very poor um, what do you think about her three bet sizing there? Um, I mean, it's kind of an awkward example with eights. I mean, yeah, but like in general, in general, when three betting, like you know, you you want to keep it three times, like somewhere around three times, like as as a basis, you know, for a reason. I mean, and it's and it's kind of like the similar reason you're gonna you're gonna get. Some, action from some worse hands um whereas you know when she makes it he makes it 12 and she makes it 60 like she's never getting action from worse hands there um and that's that's pretty much the biggest reason um why you shouldn't be making it 60 however i mean it you know if if the guy is like you can do funny things in live poker i don't think it's like as bad as you know especially when you're explaining this guy like and, and the way he, like, plays, he's super spewy and splashy. Yeah, he, he, he's, he's spewy, but he's not, like, a total clown. I, I'm i pretty sure he's calling... Uh, the, the great point you make is his calling range is pretty much becomes really narrow depend, based on her three-bet size. Her three-bet sizing isn't going to affect his calling range. So when she three-bets that big, her eights, equity-wise, her equity-wise against him his calling range goes down because he's going to tend to play his upper range more uh, when she three bets that big. Like, he's going to play, you know, like, bigger pocket pairs, ace-jack, ace-queen, king-queen suited type hands, and he's going to let go of four-five off, ace-four off, five-six suited probably. Hands that she yeah. wants in that ace does well against. So that's the main reason why is she's, when she three bets really big like that, she's narrowing his calling range, and she's actually losing overall equity uh, with her specific hand of eights against his calling range. So had she three bet to, like, say, 36, like, three times, or, uh, you know, online it would be more like two and a half times to, like, 30 or whatever, you know, he, she's keeping his calling range much wider, and she does way better with her specific hand. Now he's going to be calling with eights four off, four or five off, you know, nine, ten off, uh, but I mean, four suited. He Pants. What do you say, I mean, like, what do you say to, like, the average kind of recreational player? I mean, you know what I mean? Like, this is for someone who's really thinking about every aspect of the game, but, you know, the average recreational player is like, well, I just kind of want to, I just want to get it over with there. Yeah. They're not comfortable yeah. in playing, they're not comfortible in playing, well, yeah, like, these three-bet pots. Right. Well, it's not even three-bet. It just comes down to bet side. This is why people say one, two. People make it 20 or 30 with jacks or 10s. And then they win three bucks. They're like, oh, I'm happy to win $3. Because yeah. <laughs> jacks are so freaking hard to play post-flop. So, I'm not, but, like, it's so the same it's thing. Kind of like same, same line of thinking. It's They're giving up equity. I mean, everything. I, I, when I explain as I, I explain terms in equity. Like, you're just giving, you're leaving money out there. Sure, you win three bucks, but that hand is supposed to make you on average of, like, 12 bucks or 14 bucks. So, you're... You're losing an extra three, nine, ten dollars um, over the long run by making it that big. And yeah. and a simple way to answer why you shouldn't raise that big is you're only getting called by better and you're folding out all worse. And that's basically what's happening. When you're making it ten times a big blind, you, but you know, can see people why people do this, with, though, JK. You, like you can see why people do this. Like they're people, making a mistake. I of course they're making a mistake. I, <laughs> I understand they're making a mistake, but but people like are sometimes uncomfortable playing in these three-bet pots. Like, they're, you know, if they three-bet, I mean, you see it all the time. Like, someone three-bets to, like, $40 with kings, and now the flop comes ace, deuce, deuce, and they're like, why didn't I raise to 200 You know, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, um, people I, just don't know how to react yeah. once they get out yeah. flopped. Right. Like, well, actually, here's, uh, I mean, this, yeah, last, yeah I was, like I said, I was sweating this one-two game. Early on, the, 
uh, it goes raised. Actually, I was in the game uh, with my student. I made it six. I don't remember with what hand. Guy makes a 16, cold call. Next guy makes it $116. Like a huge overraise. Everyone falls and he shows aces. This is exactly the line of thinking <laughs> we're thinking. He's, and, he, and of course, his comment was exactly what we're talking about. I'm happy to win this pot now. I don't want to see a flop. That was his statement. It's yeah, like, my, favorite one, my favorite one is like raise, call, call, re-raise, call. And now, like, the guy on the button goes all in. This is in, like, a 1-2 game, and the guy had, like, $500. And he goes all in for $500, and he says, you're all beat. <laughs> he says it out loud. He's like, you're all beat. I don't know. <laughs> you know, I don't want to take a bad beat. Um, or, you know, some guys even, like, show their hands or whatever it is. I mean, and, and again, it's like, it's oh, like sorry, that's the are... difference between human nature of, Rather, you know, of course they're giving up a little bit in long run profits, but to help keep their a little bit, I think they're giving up a lot. Actually. Well, of course, yeah, they're giving up a lot in like long run profits, but to help keep their sanity and to help keep their uh, yeah, it's the emotional side of poker. People want to feel good; they don't want that shitty feeling when their aces get cracked. So they rather feel good and win thirty bucks then try to maximize win 100 and uh, at the risk of like a 20-30% chance of getting aces crack and they're going to be on life tilt for the next two hours or whatever. Yeah. So they're not looking at it rationally. Uh, they're looking at it emotionally. Uh, I mean, I'm trying to do my best Jared Tenler impersonation here. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, your question is like how do we teach these people to think differently? You know, I mean, it's like, yeah, it's like when, I, when I'm explaining... You know, and when I work with people, like, they want to, like, coaching, they really want to get to, like, the next level of, like, how can I do this, like, professionally? You have to, like, totally just get rid of that mindset of, and it's almost like a mindset of, like, just total human nature. Um, That's what it is. I always tell, you know, say, like, when people get emotional, the human element. And I'm just going to point to myself because I think I'm a good example. Is The reason why I've done so well is I leave like pretty much all emotion out of poker. Um, it, it prevents me from going on tilt. It prevents me from making this, these irrational decisions where it's costing me equity over the long run. So, yeah, I mean, I would just tell people, leave your emotions out of it. Think everything in terms in, uh, ra rationally, logically and in equity. Don't think in terms of, you know, the goal of poker is not to win the most hand pots or whatever. If you're winning the most pots, you're a long-term loser, guaranteed. It, so if you're shoving in 200 with aces preflop to not get called, it, congratulations, you're going to win like 100% of the time with aces, but yeah. you're, you're not going to be a winning player over the long run. So, um, you know, it just comes with experience too. I mean, people need to get familiar. The reason why people do these is because they might, there's a lot of it. Besides emotions, they might not be comfortable playing post flop. So, you and I are very comfortable playing post flop, and we're always thinking in terms of EV. So, that's why we always look for the optimal bet sizing pre flop. So, this I, just goes, yeah. And I think that's a big part of it. You know, the more you practice with like um, three betting to like a, whatever the standard size would be. Um, you know, if she, the more you practice, like, three betting to a certain size, like, the more you're going to get comfortable and, you know, you, after, you know, after that three bet's already done, now you just, like, the, the thing that I think that all the best players are good at is, you know, in, in college I studied economics, and the one thing you learn about is sunk costs. Like, once you three bet, and, like, let's say she threw about to $36. Like, that 72 or $75 is in the pot. Like, and now there, now you have a new decision. To, you know, now you have a new, everything's new. Like, you know, the board's going to be new. You're not, you're no longer, you may no longer be in the lead after the flop or whatever. Um, you're going to have $170 left, and there's going to be $75 in the pot. And, like, everything's a new decision. Um, and I think it's important to like focus on that. Um, so you know, when you three bet, when you three bet in spots like that, um, whether or not like, you know, sometimes you're gonna go broke and get the rest in behind, or sometimes you're gonna like have to check fold or whatever. But I think the more pots you play that are like that, the more you're, the more you'll be able to like kind of sit back, you know, reevaluate the situation once the flop comes out, and you'll be like, okay. 
no, here's my best decision from this point on. Um, but yeah, you know, it's just people are afraid. I think. Just I think a couple of reason. yeah, just a couple of things to wrap up this hand. Uh, someone said a standard open in my live one two game is fifteen. There's, I, I think I don't want to say you should never open big. I think you want to have a go for your bet sizing, and it also depends on your opponents. If people are calling like big bets pre-flop, then I don't see anything wrong with opening to 20 if you're getting two callers whenever, every time. So I would open 20, 30 with aces, kings. Uh, but I'm saying in general, people are usually going to call with really good hands at just whatever stakes. If you're opening 10 to 15 BBs um, with your standard opener. But if, yeah, if people are there to gamble, then I think it's fine. So uh, there's a few exceptions is the point I'm making. And on the other thing about raising a certain size pre-flop, or three betting a certain size pre-flop is to kind of set up a certain stack to pot ratio to play post-flop that i mean this goes yeah this is all about having a plan in poker too um we talk about this all the time in order to do well in poker you always need to have a plan so even though we're talking about just basically pre-flop and what what's wrong what's right but we all we want to have uh in the back of our mind a plan going forward with this hand when we do get called our stack size and what's optimal for uh our stack sizes with the specific hand we have so that's why we would three bet smaller with maybe like hands like five six suited um why we three bet a little bigger and hands like two jacks two queens because yeah. we want to have our stack to pot ratio be bigger with suited connectors, small pairs, um, and we want the stack to pot ratio to be smaller when we have really good premium hands, so it's a lot easier for us to get it in all in on the flop. So it's kind of a couple of offshoots from basing our pre-flop bet sizing. So yeah. um, anything else you want to add about pre-flop yeah, bet and, sizing? Well, well there, was, there was like one more thing I wanted to talk about. This was like an interesting hand, and I told you about this from the LAPC in which I played, and this was like the 10K buy-in main event, um, and you start with 30,000 in chips, and it was literally like my first hand at the table, or one of my first few hands at the table, but there were like two very bad, I shouldn't classify them, but from my reads, you know, they were older guys, kind of like really bad players, right? Um, and, you know, and in spots like where I think overbetting is, we never really talked about this, but like, one guy limps for 100, I raised to like 350 or 400 with 10-9 suited, and now both of these old guys called, and the flop came 6-7-8, um, and I had 10-9, right? <laughs> and now they both checked to me, and there was like 1,000 in the pot, and I bet 5,000 on the flop. <laughs> and like, um, I, I ended up, they ended up both folding, right? <laughs> well, what and is I've that? <laughs> <laughs> you five times potted it, dude. Well, <laughs> yeah. well, here's the point, though. But but my point is, it depends on what I think their calling ranges are. I mean, like, I, I got a read on these players. Or not a read, but I'm, like, looking at these players, and I'm like, well, these are two types of guys who I think will never fold to over bets on the flop. Uh, I mean, they'll just never... I mean, they'll just never fold to, like, if they flop a set or, like, a lower straight or whatever... They're just never going to fold. So I thought, why not just build a pot right now? And, and hopefully they have one of those hands. Uh, I don't know. I thought that was an interesting hand to like bring up or talk about. JK, where did uh, you go? I lost. I, I'm here. Um, <laughs> my video sh shut off. But, yeah, we already okay. argued argue this. I disagreed with you. That you're, I, I agree with you with the overbet, but I disagree with your actual sizing. And that is way too big. And <clears throat> again, I just same matter you're only getting called by better in this instance there is no better <laughs> so uh um then you're folding out all worse in this instance everything else is worse so i don't think no, but, but, but that's not true though i don't think i'm folding out all worse I, that's why i totally disagreed with you know yeah. i've talked to a couple different people about this hand i i told like i don't think i'm folding out all worse i think i'm getting the money in i think there's a high probability you're folding out all worse i think it's the uh, the bet sizing the EV and the bet sizing of getting yeah called. against a good Doesn't player they might they might fold the like for the uh, the frequency of your get, getting called by worse hands so I uh, I you know have to disagree with your bet sizing on this hand I think you're totally wrong I think you're totally wrong I think against a good player Dude, you're, you know, you're, uh, you're sporting an LA Clippers jersey who's right or wrong today so come on <laughs> <laughs> whatever. <laughs> Um, all right, so 
All right, well, let's bring on our guest, Mike Kelly, a.k.a. Ken Aces. Uh, maybe we can ask him some of the stuff uh, we disagree on. Mike's a long yeah, well, time pro online and live, and he's been coaching for a few years. So we'll bring him on right after this break. All right. And now, your hosts, John Kim and Joe Tihan. All right, so we're back with Mike Kelly, a.k.a. Ken Aces. I'm going to go over a little background of Mike. Been playing professionally since 2007. Um, beats up live games, 1530 limit hold'em, 500 NL. Uh, and also you've been a pretty consistent winning online player um, on Stars and Full Tilt pre-Black Friday. And you've been coaching for about four years now, so you have that under your belt. I'm sure you can provide a lot of insight. Um, but one thing I wanted to ask you, Mike, and welcome to the show, Mike. Hey, John. Hey, hey. Mike. And Joe. Our, my hey, Joe. Joe. I don't nice know to if meet you've you. Ever met him. Um, he's the guy that likes to overbet five times pot when he has a nut. <laughs> I heard. And fall out everybody. <laughs> oh, did you so, hear that, hand, Mike? Uh, well, I, uh, I did. I finally, think, okay. finally we get a logical that? thinker on the show. I'm sure he. I'm sure he understands value. Well, I mean, I'm not a tournament guy, so I, I, I can't really say too much. But I kind of feel like you get called by sets and fold everything else. And okay, like. Like, especially if you said they're older guys, like my generic older guy Reed is weak tight. So, you know, they're just going to like, you know, even pitch tens or something or jacks or something. Uh, of course, I'm losing value from like my nines, tens, jacks. I'm losing value from like eight, nine, things like that. But my argument is that you can gain a lot of value by over betting, but not that big. Maybe 2K, 3K, like two times, three times. And. Okay. Yeah, uh, and also this is a 10k buy-in. It's what was a level one. People are gonna, people are not gonna call those bet sizes and go broke level. Yeah, they're one not gonna call. That's the point. Into the tournament. They're not but gonna guess, call. That's, but yeah, but they're gonna the, say, "Oh wow, I flopped a set. I can't fold. I'm all in." Like they're not gonna call. <laughs> I realize they're not gonna call. Like. Oh, well, you just answered why you're wrong. Then they're not gonna call. So why would you? They're bet gonna five? shove like all these hands. They realize they can't. They'll oh, realize. They're well, it's I can't get the showdown with this hand. Even bad players are going to want to, like, you know, play a couple of hours and get their feet wet and have the experience of playing a 10K event. So how it, deep were you that you needed to overbet the flop? We, were, we, were, we started the hand with 30K. Everyone started with 30K. 300 bigs deep. How much, John? 300 BBs deep. Oh, 300 BBs deep. Okay, so yeah. I see. You're trying to, like, blow the hell out of the pot on the flop. Yeah, he's just, yeah, I mean, I, this is almost the same lines of, like, betting 500 no. with aces in a 1-2 game, Joe. He no, just, that's so wrong. That's so wrong. <laughs> <laughs> so if, if I ever play with you, Joe, I know you might have slight bet sizing tells. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, when, he bets, when he's betting five times pot, he, he better pot. If you, if you have to understand my read. My read is that they're never folding, like, two pair or sets or, like, lower straights or anything. So yeah, just, why... Why not? Why not build it to the point where they just have to get it in? I, I think I'm on like 200 or to 500 buying tournament, sure. But in a 10k event, uh, I doubt they're calling enough. Often. Yeah, that's that's a like, small. You can't really say that. They, like uh, there must be a bunch of millionaires playing 10ks. So, I mean, if someone's in a tournament, they're just going to play poker the way they know how to play poker. And these old guys know that. Okay, if I flop two pair of set, if they if they could beat aces on that board, they were gonna go with it. They were gonna shove all in, I think. Uh, whatever, yeah, because just, of my bet. But uh, whatever, let's get uh, let, yeah, let's, 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 let's change the Let's talk about Ken. Uh, I wanted to ask you, Ken, uh, or Mike. I'm sorry, I keep calling you Ken. That's so funny because I had that's you on okay. Skype as Ken. So where did the name Ken Aces come from? Just oh, sorry. that's that's I don't even remember. I think when I started playing online poker a million years ago, I just came up with the dumbest name I could and that happened to be it. So no good stories. <laughs> I, don't even know if I wish I'd pick something much better because now I'm stuck that's not with it. Original. That thing is like a boring name. No, no, no knock on you, Mike. But <laughs> It is a tough <laughs> name. I hate it, but I'm stuck with it. <laughs> uh, okay, so uh, I wanted to ask you, it says in your coaching profile, which is located at cardrunners.com, uh, where I do make some videos, but uh, it says you're a poker dealer for a year which has allowed you to understand how both the good and bad players think about poker. Can you kind of elaborate on that? Um, yeah, I dealt in a underground poker club um, at different points for one to three nights a week. 
and it was a sort of a trip just to hear everybody talk about the game, watch about the game, you know, see the game from you know the box from the dealer seat gave me a different perspective on everything and man was i having flashbacks when you guys were talking about plo8 because for a time i was actually dealing a plo8 game and playing one regularly oh and, how was that did you learn anything dealing that uh, game yeah i learned how to efficiently chop pots as a dealer if you don't play that game uh the, the sickest live game i've ever played in actually was a Five five blind thousand max PLO eight game that I think four guys crushed and everybody else lost because they didn't know what they're doing. I've never seen good players have a bigger edge than than that game, and it only lasted two months because all the all the weak players went broke, like literally broke. <laughs> if you, if you play versus weak players in that game, boy, they they don't stand a chance if you know what you're doing. All right, I think Joe would agree with that. Yeah. It's a really good game, PLO8. Yeah, if it. you can get, yeah, it's one of those games right now where it's so. I don't want to say it's very new, but it's overall most people haven't played it, and it's going to be new to most players. So if you know what you're doing, then it's kind of equivalent to almost like no limit of five years ago. So it could be a gold mine right now. Um, I, think, I think it's true. The only drawback in the live setting is it's really slow. Like hands per hour is going to be cut in half from an Olympic game. It's really slow. So yeah. That hurts your hourly. All right. So, okay. So, and you've, you've been, like, I like the fact you're kind of like me. I played a lot online and um, pre-Black Friday. Post-Black Friday, you've played a lot live. You probably played more live than me, to be honest. I'm not sure. Um, and you're thinking about moving to Florida. And we're talking about this right before. Um, you're saying, like, uh, you're checking out the 1-2 games, maybe even dabbled it down there. And you're saying the rake was abnormally high and how it affects people's win rates. Do you want to touch on that a little bit? Sure. Um, I didn't play any 1-2 when I was there. I played 2-5, no limit, and 5-10, no limit. But the rake was the same structure for 1-2, 2-5, and 5-10. And they take 7 bucks. What they do is they take a $5 rake, and they take $2 for promotionals, you know, high hands, various tournaments, he gives giveaways and such. But, man, if you're a 1-2 player and you're paying $7 almost every hand uh, wow now, how much how much amazing. of the um, how much of the when they take money for either the bad beat jackpot or the high hand are they paying it back back a hundred percent or I I couldn't answer that in any detail but I'd be willing to bet that they're never paying back a hundred percent right they're gonna take yeah at minimum some kind of administration fee and you know for the for the player who pops into that room once in a blue moon like, they're never going to see that money. I mean, even for the regulars, they'll win a high hand every now and then. But they didn't do a lot of bad beat jackpots. Yeah, but, but can, it was but, more like but high we, hand this hour, high hand this hour, give away a $65 tournament seat every now and then kind of stuff. Yeah, we talk about everything in terms of equity, though. You know what I mean? So if you're dropping a dollar, it doesn't matter if you're going to be the one to hit that high hand or not. Like, if they're dropping a dollar for the high hand, whether or not you hit it or not, you're you're probably losing, like... 25 cents on every dollar or whatever it may be like because we're, we're thinking of everything in terms of equity so like yeah i mean realistically yeah the rake is probably five plus you know an extra like 30 or 40 cents on each of those drops right well yeah i see what you're saying it's you know it's five plus two for a total of seven but maybe your equity of that two dollars is you know some percentage um, yeah yeah but as far as what they actually pay out to the players i don't know i just know that you know, if there's an opportunity for a casino to make money on it, they're going to. So are you saying that people in Florida should avoid the 1-2 games because the rake is so high? Or is it just hard to overcome that? Or your win rate is not going to be very high because of the rake? And people are just not very aware of how much rake affects your overall win rate? Um, yeah, I haven't really thought of it in terms of whether or not I would tell someone not to play 1-2, but it's got to be a factor. I mean, that's... That's a big rake to overcome, especially because the game isn't deep. It's not like Vegas where you can play a 1-2 game and buy in for you know a lot more, but down there, they're capped games, so the buy-ins are 200 or 300 depending on where you are, and there are a lot of players at the table who are buying in shorter, so then the rake becomes you know a, even a bigger piece of the pie in terms of affecting your win rate because the pots on average are going to be smaller. 
Yeah, I'm I'm kind of guilty of that. Just like not paying attention to rake. I just sit down and it's like, okay, let's play poker. I don't even know. What, I never even check out what the rake is wherever I'm at. But I'm the, I'm uh, the same way. It's very so, uh, bad. It yeah, must be uh, the dealer in me. I noticed it firsthand. Firsthand, they took seven dollars in a, like a very small pot in a two-five game, and I was like, what? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, see, I probably would have never noticed if I sat in one two game down there until you yeah. told me. I'm like, if I went if once you told me at seven bucks, I'm like, wow, that I know that's abnormally high and be tough to beat that game for a good win rate. I mean, the way I looked at it, I mean, you know, again, I was I was playing in a two five game, and they took the blinds out of the pot, right? They took the small blind and big blind uh, out of the pot, right? That was the rake. <laughs> That was the rake, right? I mean, That's you know, you crazy. raise, someone calls, you what, see. What's bet, the and... point of playing for the whole point of hold them? It starts out. Your goal is to win the blinds. I know <laughs> they take the blinds out; they're gone. <laughs> so they're raking the blinds. What are you playing for? Like initially, <laughs> I Why mean, would you every... play anything but aces, <laughs> right? I mean, every place plays. You know, has a different speed at which they take the rake, right? But whatever it was on average down there, they actually took it quite quickly. So it wasn't like you had to get to a hundred dollar pot for them to take the seven out. They took the seven way before that. Yeah. Um, so, so like it, a standard rake you know, and oh yeah. Go ahead, yeah. I, you know, I just it's it's a factor. It just sort of surprised me as someone who plays much more Fox with Atlantic City, Vegas, where the rakes are you know roughly the same. And I think you know right much about easier. what four bucks I think up to four sometimes five. Yeah, they, I I depends on where you play in AC. It's four or five because some of them have yeah. a bad jackpot and then. In uh, in Foxwoods, the two five game, there's no bad B jackpot eligible for two five, so they only take four dollar rate there. And right. you guys, of course, know Vegas better than me. Yep. Okay. Um, I want to get to because you have a background in both live and online, and we we're talking about this before decision making and why it's important. And I thought we had a pretty good conversation. I wanted to share it with our listeners is uh, how you come to decisions live versus online and how it's different for those people that are trying to go from one to the other or trying to learn both and how it's different. Uh, you and I are mostly online backgrounds. Joe is mostly live. So uh, as online players, we relied on HUD. And I, I actually, you brought up a couple of interesting points about using a HUD. A HUD is a program that shows stats of your opponents. And I was saying, you know, as online players, we should base most of our decisions on HUD. And actually, you corrected me. Um, what did you say about using a HUD? Well, I, I think that, you know, the HUD is an uh, awesome tool. I mean, uh, I just, uh, after having been mostly away from online poker, just this past week I installed, uh, you know, the latest, greatest software package, you know, the new Holder Manager 2 and all the bells and whistles. And it is amazing how much data is in there. And there's no question they're really powerful for game selection, for leak finding, for reviewing your own play, for finding and exploiting leaks in your opponents, and all that stuff is great. But I once heard it said, and I wish I remembered who, because it was probably a poker video I watched, but I don't remember who, that the HUD is frequency data. All you get is frequencies. It's a bunch of statistics about how many times someone does X in situation Y. Where, and that's great and useful and important, but sometimes online players forget what I call direct evidence data. What hands do they get seen at showdown how did someone play some part of their range in a certain situation and sometimes i think there's a tendency at least in the guys i'm coaching at sort of you know lower stakes no limit hold them to really become hud bots where they they forget to think about the poker forget to think about equity like i heard you guys talking about earlier they forget to talk about ranges and they're just looking for the magic hud statistic to make a decision for them rather than learning the fundamentals of the game. And then when they go play live, they're not used to sort of observing, remembering, retaining, using that direct evidence, you know, seeing a showdown, seeing how a player plays and extrapolating what that mean, might mean for another situation against that same player. Right. Yeah. I, and I, I like this comment you made. So HUD is basically uh, information frequency data and live hands is basically um, direct data from showdowns, and you base your decisions off that. But like you said, we have a tendency as online players to be too reliant on HUD, 
and just kind of overlooking the fundamentals of the game and taking yeah, the proper I, lines. I agree, Mike. Like, I, I hear a lot of times, you know, when people give a hand history, they'll say, well, you know, they'll, they'll never tell me, like, what happened in the hand. They'll be like, well, I sat down at the table, <laughs> and this guy, this guy played five hands in a row, and he raised all five hands, and, or, or you know, whatever. I'm, I'm like, you know, get on to the hand that just happened. Like, because a lot of times, you know, you can, you can make slight adjustments, but, but overall, I think, uh, you know, I think things like that, it, it's way overrated. Uh, you can make slight adjustments for, you know, based on your read or based on, like, you know, I really think this guy's, like, super wide here or something. Um, so it's uh, yeah, you're saying fundamentals should overpower like the frequencies at the rate people do things. Um, yeah, exactly. Like, right. So, uh, and I wanted to share a couple of things when it comes to the HUD because I always like talking about HUDs. Anything related to online is uh, when I first started playing online, I never used a HUD. So, and I did well because my game was more of a feel and just kind of reading people and never tilting or whatever. But as the games got tougher, I realized to stay ahead with everybody else, all the kids were using HUDs and stuff. I mean, whatever, I started learning how to use a HUD. And then people were kind of pounding into my head. HUD is very important doing that. I remember, Joe, you had a world roommate at the World Series from Canada, and we saw his HUD, and he had like 50 stats <laughs> when he grinded yeah, like 12 I... games. And I was just well, like, whoa, I was blown away by that. Because I'm using my HUD. I have like six stats, like the VPIP, PFR, three bat, faulted three bat, uh, aggression factor. That's probably it. And he yeah, has when like I 50 used stats. And I'm I was like, the same the way. Hell? I used the three. I used the. I had like six or nine stats or whatever, or six stats. But I, I mean, I really only looked at like the top three: their VPIP, their PFR, and their um, their three bat percentage. Especially their three bat percentage. That that one really helped. I thought. Yeah. Um, so. I see this kid, your roommate, uh, for the summer, and I'm like, yeah. wow, dude, like, how are, are, I mean, do you actually use all of that? And his response was, yeah, I use all the stats and come up with the, I'm like, and I was just thinking, is this what today's game has come to? It's just like being so reliant on all these stats and basing your decisions. So I don't know. So what I ended up doing was incorporating more. So I went from six to, I have this little notepad that shows all my stats. I have probably about, uh, 20 stats now, but I probably still only look at six of them when I play. So I guess my mentality is well, I guess everyone's doing it, so I have to do it. But when I play, I, I like I, I think like what Mike was saying, you're saying. I just think of fundamentally wise, and base a lot of my decisions that way. Um, every once in a while, I'll look at these stats. I mean, like a Turner River when a guy raises all in, then I might go into some of these specific stats. But overall, I just revert to my fundamental understanding of the game than relying on these um, HUD stats. I mean, a couple of stats that I've been using more that I never used before was full to three bet and flop check raise just because the online games are so aggressive. Um, I actually think I use the stats more than you do, John, listening to that description. Um, I, I look for, sure. obviously, for sure. seat selection, game selection, they're, they're huge, right? You know, right. just to be able to find the weaker players. But also, even against the regs, I'm always looking for spots where I think that maybe I can exploit them. You know, a spot where I feel like they might be unbalanced, and I'll you know I'll look for those things in the HUD. And and again, I'm I'm blown away by the the new stuff. Um, I think it makes it sort of easier to tease out instead of looking at a sea of numbers. It feels a little bit more like you can you know maybe use more of that information in a in-game setting. Um, but even to review someone's game, like if there's a reg you're playing with all the time, I've definitely gone into the stats not while playing and just going crazy trying to break out someone's game so i know exactly how to you know win more or lose less to them depending on who they are right uh well uh, let's move on to live play so uh, whereas sure. online we're you know we rely on our fundamental game with a lot of help from our stats from our hud how do you base your decision in live since we don't have a hud on hand um and we're talking about a couple of hands you played recently. So if you want to share that, that's fine. Um, sure. I mean, I think the, the fundamentals are kind of the same between the games. Um, with one major difference, in my mind, playing online, the vast majority of pots wind up being heads up. Six max or even full ring today. You know, you raise, someone calls, or you raise, someone three bets, and you're, you're heads up on the flop. Whereas live... 
you know, you're much, much more likely to be uh, in a multi-way situation. Um, are, you, are you guys still there? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay, I'm sorry. Yeah, I got a worry. funny thing on my screen. <clears throat> don't worry about it. That's uh -huh. okay. So I, mean, I think the fundamentals are the same. And because the game is so much more of a multi-way game, you know, you know, you see four or five players go to the flop, even in a raised pot is so common. That means that in a live game, I'm probably playing much more about pot equity and much less about fold equity. So, you know, I'm doing a lot more thinking about can I value bet? Um, really, that's my live game. Can I value bet? I'm always looking to value bet. And I think that's where I make most of my money. The, uh, the hand example that uh, John and I talked about earlier is funny because for me, it's not so common, but I actually made money in this example, bluff catching, which is you know, not usually a, uh, like a huge source of profit for me. I think most of these live games players still continue to call down way too much, way too I think, Yeah, I think that's a really good point, Mike. Um, way, way, way more money in live poker especially is made from value betting as opposed to bluff catching. Uh, yeah. And I mean, I... I mean, I can't, like, I, I can't really say, like, how much more is made one way or another, but it just, from my experience, it's, it's like, tenfold. I mean, it's, it's incredible, I yeah. think. I, I couldn't put yeah. a number on it, but I agree. It's, it's a, a big difference. Like, and one of the sort of theory things that I talk about in the coaching, both live and online, is just this idea, of, you know, that you make money in poker by basically fold equity plus pot equity, figuring out where you are with those two variables and you know betting when you have a lot of fold equity and or a lot of pot equity and if you write that equation out money equals fold equity plus pot equity when you go to play live poker just cross out the fold equity part <laughs> and focus on the pot equity. <laughs> <laughs> and, and that gets you like you know 80 percent of the way there i think um but yeah, anyway, so John asked me for, for a hand, and this was kind of an idea related to this direct evidence in that, you know, I might have a general idea that someone is loose or really tight, in other words, some general idea of their frequencies in a live game. But beyond that, you know, what do I know how many hands in a row they played in the last three hours? But if you're watching and paying attention to every showdown, there's a lot of stuff you can learn. And I think this hand is kind of an example of that and maybe an example of, you know, some fundamental things. So this player in a previous hand had a pair of kings and a flush draw on an ace-high board, and I had check-raised the turn as a semi-bluff. And he called, and he rivered a king, and I checked, and he checked back trip kings on a board where, like, trip kings was the nuts. So I know that this player does not value bet thin at all. And I'd also seen him when he did value bet earlier in the session. It was more like half pot kind of value bets on the river. So that's the background. That's sort of the direct evidence I had leading into this hand. Uh, let's see. I was in the big blind, and I believe I had king eight. It was a limped pot, five, maybe six way. Uh, I checked the big blind. We go to the flop. Seven, eight, five. So I guess I should say eight, seven, five. Two spades. And I just value bet my hand. I think I have the best hand here. I don't want to give a you know free looks at a turn because I'm very likely to be outdrawn. I think I can bet and get called by worse. Um, I get one caller. Everyone else folds. We go to the turn. The turn is an ace. I think his range is still very much, you know, weaker eights or weaker one pairs or maybe some draws. So I value bet the turn, and he calls. Again, the flop was eight, seven, five, two spades, ace on the turn that was not a spade, and the river is the six of diamonds. So we go to a final board of ace, seven, five, ace, six where the flush draws have missed but you know there's a four liner to a straight here so it's certainly a scary board um, I checked the river out of position and he bets fifty dollars into what was probably a six I know I didn't get all the bet sizing in the story but the pot's probably sixty ish at this point and he bets fifty on the river so this is a a large bet in 
in this live game. And he did it in such a way that it looked very much like I'm so strong. You know, kind of a strong as weak tell, right? He gave me the stare down and he just sort of like smacked out this $50 in the middle, like, you know, I'm the man kind of a thing. So immediately alarm bells are going off in terms of like the tell department. But then I stopped and I was thinking and I realized that this guy is never ever betting two pair on that river. He can't bet trip kings on the river. How could he bet two pair? And if he's never betting two pair, he doesn't really have a lot of nines in his range. So this is where I think fundamentals can really help. If if you, after a session, go back and find some interesting hands and, and actually work through the math, work through the fundamentals, um, you can find a call here. And, and I did call, and he had busted spades. I believe it was uh, King Jack of spades. But what do you guys think of the hand? I don't know. I mean, I thought that was a sick call. I think I would tend to fold more than because I'm scared on those boards. Four, five, six, seven, or five, six, seven, eight board. What do you think, Joe? I mean, that sounds like a pretty good call. The only thing, uh, the only thing I, I do think that's important when looking at history is some guys, especially in live poker, and it's like this. This does help when you're like watching the game when you're not involved in hands, where it's like how did he ever check back the river? Like, in, in the spot with the Kings, it's like, how does this guy ever check back the river? So, like, when thinking about this hand, I would, you know, you can pretty much eliminate him value betting all aces up, all two pairs, all, probably even a four, right? Like, like I don't, I, I just, don't, I don't think he would bet $50 with a four in that spot, right? Like, 50 into a $60 oh, yeah. pot. It just doesn't I, seem very logical. Um... It seems like there are a lot of combinations of like nine, seven, nine, eight, uh, well, nine, actually, five. Actually, Joe, you know, I, sh I probably should have mentioned it. The eight of spades was either on the board or my hand. I don't remember which now. Okay. So he can't have eight, nine. Okay, and, okay. And he's not going to call the turn bet with just a gutter ball. So the nine X combos that I'm thinking he can possibly have are, you know, they call flop and call turn are something like ace nine of spades, ten nine of spades, jack nine of spades. And that's all I could come up with. I mean, you don't think you would call the turn with, like, middle pair plus a nine, like... Like seven nine? Yeah, seven nine or eight nine even. Uh, nine ten gets there too, the top open ender. And, and nine ten for the top open ender. I, I think the reason why... Mike called is because his observation from the previous couple of hands, and that's the point Mike's making, is that we gather data. We don't have a HUD, so we gather data from history, uh, previous hands, um, just watching, like you said, Joe, observing players when you're not in a hand or, what, or when you're in a hand. And yeah. just the way he played hands on the river led Mike to believe, okay, well, he's never value betting here. His bet sizing makes no sense based on his previous history. So this feels like more like a bluff here. And, it, you know, if you in include, like, combinatorics of just, you know, combination of hands, you know, uh, Mike thinks it's weighted towards busted draws since he is tends to check back, like, a four, never betting sets two pairs here on the river. So the only thing you can have is a 9x type hand, and Mike just thinks there's a lot more combos of bluffs than uh, nines. Um, and I assume that's what Mike was thinking when he called the river. Um, uh, yeah, like, I'm not even sure he's got 10-9 off in his range to call the turn, this this particular player. Like, I think if he calls the turn with 10-9, I kind of would be surprised. I'm not saying he couldn't ever show up with 10-9, but I definitely am discounting 10-9 without the flush draw, you know? Right. And 10-9, and like, that had the flush draw and the straight draw might have raised the flop or raised the turn. Uh, all sets, I'm sure, are raising flopper turns, so he never has a set by the river, unless he, like, rivered pocket sixes. But he might not even bet pocket sixes like this guy, I mean, on that board. So yeah. I think he winds up with something in the neighborhood of, like, 15, depending on his exact limp range, he's probably has something like 15 or so. I, actually, this is kind of fun. It's one of the things I do after a session is I scribble it down and play around with numbers, and I, I found my notes on it. I think I worked out my estimate was something like 16 or 17 combos of, of busted flush draws 
and just a handful of combos of nine X of spades, like literally just four or five. And you're right, maybe he has ten nine off some of the time, or you know, ten nine of a different suit. Yeah. So maybe you add a few of those in, but still, he's at least half of his river combos, if not even more than half, are just busted spades. Yeah, I kind of tend to think you might be underestimating the number of nine X types in his hands. Uh, Joe might feel the same way, I think. But uh, the point we're making is. Yeah, I like how you're using previous data. Uh, again, since we don't have access to a HUD, we gather information and um, we, you know, apply that. Again, poker is just a game of incomplete information, and then we try to make the most plus EV decision. Yeah. And um, you, you know, you probably your call is probably plus EV. You say it is, so I'll just take your word on that. So, um, yep. what I'm saying, the the conclusion is that you've used your previous experiences with this guy to come to that decision. Um, yeah, I think so. I mean, I think it's a mix of a mix of the combinatorics, a mix of the bet sizing. Like, I don't think he'd even bet that big if he had the straight. He'd want to get called, so he'd bet twenty or thirty. And then, you know, the physical tells. And he gave you the it, stare down. <laughs> yeah, you know, like all that rolled up together. I think made it kind of a fun spot. It's probably a terrible hand for us to talk about on the show because now we're yeah. like recommending people check call rivers against big bets, <laughs> which is I'm sure like you know close your eyes and check fold big bet on rivers is probably the best line in a one two game anyway. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah it's, 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 it's fun that we. It's funny that we preface this conversation by saying. Exactly. You don't, make, you don't make money by bluff catching, and and then you tell you tell us the sand, which is right, right. Totally. that's good. That, next time I'll try to do a value bet hand. Yeah, no, but I, I like the our original point is just gathering data and stuff like that. Like I was saying last night, I was playing with a student one two, and there was a certain player I was getting involved with a lot of hands with, and here's a couple of hand examples really quickly. Uh, and like a four-way pot, the board is eight, seven, four, ace, six. So any five makes straight. And there's four diamonds on board. And he leads out into four players. And another guy calls. And when my, one of my student's friends has two red tens with the ten of diamonds. And he hero calls the river, over calls. The guy that calls was a bad player, too, in the middle. And neither of them had a diamond, which is crazy. Uh, here, here, the hand. It's it's different if like they have the bottom pair turning a bottom pair into a bluff, but it's suicidal betting into three, four guys. The guy that bet out has a seven without a diamond. He has aces up. So I'm like, what the? Heck? That could be the worst bet in the history of Sick poker. Value. What is, I don't know if he's going for value. What 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 is he doing with that hand? He has aces up on a on a one card straight, one card flush board. The other guy has a straight. The guy has ace five for an eight high straight. And with two guys behind him, he calls that hand. And so my friend made the right call because he knew the, these guys are both bad. And I'm just thinking, like, I yeah. think that's kind of that's kind of funny to talk about. But it, it it is kind of important. Like you see people who will fold behind there, um, where they think they might have the caller beat, but they're like worried about the guy they bet and whatever. And it's like now that the guy actually called and you think he may be calling pretty light, like, now you're even getting that much better pot odds. Now you only have to be right, like, instead of, like, you know, the first bet, you have to be right, like, one out of two times. Now another guy calls. Now it's like, okay, I only have to be right one in three times. <laughs> you know what I mean? So that's even more incentive to call with, like, you know, the 10 high flush there. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, that's a good, bet, that's a good yeah, call. And this guy also bet four – Pocket four is on like a king, ten, seven, six, deuce board uh, in a spot where he's never good. So the rest of the night, I was calling this guy light. Um, that's the thing. I gather information. This guy, when he bets the river, I don't think he knows what he's doing. So I have to pay off with any semblance of a hand. Uh, obviously, against me, he always had the nuts, whatever. <laughs> but everybody else, he had in the air. <laughs> so, he had uh, top two against you, just on yeah, better it's, boards. <laughs> it's, no, funny you, it's funny you say that, John, like that the guy was betting the four pocket fours on a king x board because there, there's there been a bunch of live spots where I'm just dying to make ace high calls because it makes sense for them having nothing. And then they wind up with a hand that, like, you're describing they should basically never bet like the betting bottom pair because they don't know what else to do and they don't want to check fold or something crazy so it's like a little rule that i try not to make too many ace high call downs even when i feel like god i want to call this spot because people will turn over the most ridiculous bottom pairs too often to make it plus ev yeah they're bluffing with the best 10 is what ends yep. up happening yep. So they think that. But anyway, I want to thank you for coming on the show, Mike. Um, again, your coaching prof profile is up at cardrunners.com. Uh, are you accepting students now? 
Uh, yep. If anybody's interested, they can uh, hop on Card Runners and look in the coaching feedback thread where people have said some nice stuff about me. Um, I also have a blog under Ken Aces, or they can Skype me um, at Ken Aces with no space, just K E N A C E S on Skype. Yeah, and you're pretty, and you're pretty uh, proficient in online and live, and you can probably help people that want to make the transition from one to the other too. So, which is awesome, and uh, there, there could be a ton of value in that. Um, so, did you say what your going rate was for coaching? Uh, no, I didn't, but it's uh, it's fifteen hour. Yeah, which yeah. is very. Uh, I mean, that's you know really very good value. Enough. I think. Yeah. Yeah. I think fifty bucks an hour, so it's very good. Um, okay, well, are you on Twitter or anything? Nope, not on Twitter or anything, but, you know, um, 15 hours seems great to me because if people want to pay me 15 hour to talk about poker, I can't complain. Okay. <laughs> I and talk always, about poker for free all day long anyway. <laughs> right. Well, thanks again for coming on the show, and you can follow Joe at Joe T. Han on Twitter, uh, me at Nicolette Poker on Twitter, and I email Twitter. <laughs> I hate Twitter, Mike. Don't don't I, even bother. I, I, I won't. I, I, yeah, I, I actually like Twitter. It gives me something to read while I'm grinding live. Just kind of see how deep everybody is in tournaments, stuff like that. <laughs> so, um, yeah. okay, and email me at john at stackingcoaching dot com and joe at joe tihan at joe t at joe t poker at gmail at gmail dot com. And again, uh, thanks for listening, guys. This is Cash Plays at quadjacks dot com, brought to you by Stackham Coaching. Dot com and we'll see you guys next time. All right, thanks guys.